Hello, and welcome to episode one of Using Visuals to Enhance Learning, where today's essential question is, how do people learn? Now, this question is significant because as higher education faculty, we are charged with the responsibility of designing instruction, even though we are really the subject matter experts and technically not instructional designers. In other words, we possess the expertise in our field, but may not necessarily understand how to break down what we know and facilitate meaningful learning experiences for our students. And so it is, we find ourselves responsible for selecting instructional materials, developing instructional activities, assessing and evaluating learning, and then designing and delivering instruction online without much, if any, training on how to do so. Let me give you an example of what I mean. When I was an undergrad, I remember a fellow student running down the hall of my dorm, crying and wailing, trying her best to make her way to her room as fast as possible. She sounded like she was in excruciating pain or as if she was experiencing some sort of terror. The shrillness of her cry is still embedded in my long-term memory, which by the way is a term that I'll be discussing today. So the word on the streets or in the dorm, I should say, was that she was failing her accounting class and she was an accounting major with a chancellor scholarship that required her to maintain an extremely high GPA. Come to find out, the professor who taught the accounting course was known for passing out F's like communion bread and wine. It did not faze him one bit that the fact that so many students failed his course reflected his inability to teach. In fact, he was known to flex his collar as he apparently found this fact to be an achievement. So he may have been a top-notch CPA who knew all there was to know about accounting, but he could not effectively take what was in his head and simplify it for a novice. Now raise your hand if you have ever taken a college course and wondered, is it me? What in the world is happening here? Because I just do not understand this information. Well, I've had my own experience with that. I remember taking geography my freshman year, which is a subject that I was not the least bit interested which did not help. Nevertheless, I took this geography course and earned a D. Yes, I said a D as in dog. Now in high school, I was a straight A student, which landed me the honorable valedictorian position in my senior class. So imagine my shock when my grades did not reflect the level of performance I had achieved my whole life. Well, it wasn't just that I was disinterested Because let me tell you, science does not interest me at all, thanks to my third grade teacher. Yet I managed to focus and earn A's in all of my science courses. But it was the professor's inability to engage the class and to make the content interesting and digestible. Truth be told, a teacher, a public speaker, a trainer can make content that you were not interested in appealing enough for you to learn if they're skilled at what they're doing. Amen? Alrighty then. And so I was one of three people to earn a D while the rest of the class earned Fs. So where am I going with this? You see, there are faculty in colleges and universities worldwide who are experts in their discipline, but do not understand how people learn, or how to design effective instruction so that students successfully master learning outcomes and leave their classrooms as what I call learning commanders. So my goal is to be a part of the solution by helping as many higher education faculty as I can so that teaching and learning online is enjoyable, beneficial, relevant, relatable, 
applicable to all involved. I am Dr. Kelly Austin, your e-learning strategist who is passionate about helping you master the art of teaching college courses online. Now, this audio shop is going to be interactive. So I'm going to need you to grab a sheet of paper and draw two lines so that you have three columns. Those columns will represent three stores, but not the kind of stores that may have come to mind when you heard me say it. They're going to represent memory stores. Label the first column, sensory memory. The second column, working memory. And the third column, long-term memory. I hope by the end of this brief episode, you will understand how people learn based on your comprehension of how these three memory stores work together. Now we could spend a semester or two just learning about memory, but since I only want to hold your ears for a short amount of time, I'm going to give you the Cliff's Notes version of what they mean. Now, if you're my age or a little bit younger, you may remember Cliff's Notes. If not, it just means the short version that highlights the most important information. So let's talk about sensory memory. The word sensory relates to sensation or the physical senses or anything transmitted or perceived by the senses. Now, the early childhood and elementary school teacher in me would tell you to draw an eye for sight in that first column, a nose for smell, hands for touch, ears for sound, and a tongue for taste. So I think I'm going to do that. Let me let you take some time now and draw those items in that column under sensory memory. Now, there are some fancy terms for what you drew, like the olfactory sense for the sense of smell. But remember, I'm giving you the Cliff's Notes, so we're not going to get into all of that. So sensory memory is a very short-term memory store for information that is processed by our senses. For example, visual memory is thought to hold information for less than a second. That's all I want you to remember about sensory memory right now. We're going to move on to working memory. Richard Mayer, a world-renowned psychologist, and Ruth Clark define working memory as the center of all conscious thinking, including deliberate learning. The thing about working memory is that it is limited in capacity. By limited, I mean that research has shown, listen to this, that learners can process an estimated three to four elements of new information at one time, or four to five bits of information simultaneously. Another thing to note is that unless information in work and memory is rehearsed or actively attended, it only lasts for 10 to 15 seconds. It actually takes mental effort to hold information in working memory for an extended period of time, which can also cause cognitive overwhelm. So if you're thinking, well, if its capacity is limited, wouldn't it be called short-term memory? I would say you are on the right track. Psychologists today have replaced the term short-term memory with working memory. So right underneath working memory in that middle column, you can make a note of that. Now let's talk about why working memory is so important. Well, it's because as we design instruction, we must be aware that learners can process only a few elements at any one time. So our job as online faculty is to ensure that we keep the limited capacity of working memory in the forefront of our minds so that we don't overload it. 
Come with me down memory lane and think back to an experience where you felt so overwhelmed by the content you were consuming in a course. Was it the lecture that was going on and on and on while you sat there trying to decipher what important info to include in your notes? Was it a textbook with images paired with captions and loaded text in a small font all over the page? Let me tell you a little something about that. I took an art course in undergrad that uh, the textbook was filled with all these you know, portraits and images with these captions underneath. And the font was so small and there was so much text. And instead of testing us on the content that was on the pages of the textbook, my professor thought he was being cute and, te and tested us on the captions underneath the images. Can you all believe that? I'm not, I'm not going to give you just another sad undergrad story, but it happens. Now, for you, was it a video that lasted way too long and included jargon that you felt was way over your head? Come on, I know there is at least one experience in your education that strongly imposed on your working memory when you were simply just trying to learn. Well, I want you to keep that feeling in mind as you are designing instruction and selecting or creating instructional materials. But before we move on to long-term memory, I must introduce one key term for you to include under that middle column. That term is cognitive load. Write that down. Cognitive load refers to the demands placed on working memory in terms of storage and information processing. So our challenge is to promote cognitive processing that is like little Goldilocks porridge. Not too much, not too little, but just right. <laughs> Last but not least, let's move on over to the final column and get into this long-term memory. Long-term memory is a permanent, large-capacity repository of information, including organized knowledge structures and schemas. That's a mouthful, right? So let me put it in layman's terms. Long-term memory is unlimited in its capacity, and it involves your brain taking information from that short-term memory store, that working memory, and creating memories that last for an indefinite period of time. These memories can be from an hour ago to decades ago. How is that possible? Well, it's because your long-term memory is stored outside of your conscious mind. However, those memories can be called forth into working memory when you need them. Now, there are two types of long-term memory that I want you to write in that third column. Procedural, which is also called implicit long-term memory, and declarative, which is also called explicit long-term memory. Procedural or implicit long-term memories are information related to activities that you learn through practice and repetition while declarative long-term memories include information about facts, rules, events, definitions, and experiences that you can still recall when necessary. So now this is the good part. Working memory and long-term memory can interact during learning. You see, what a learner already knows, which is called their prior knowledge, is stored in long-term memory. And it can help working memory process information, allowing for more information to be learned. Now, what does that mean? That means that tapping into prior knowledge is a great way to connect new information so that it is much easier to understand and retain. Isn't that good news? Well, 
our time is up. And today, we've talked about three memory stores, sensory memory, working memory, which was once called short-term memory, and long-term memory, and laid the foundation for understanding how people learn. Now, I have a challenge for you, or maybe you could call it homework. (laughs) I want you to go to one of your courses and ask yourself these three questions, and I'm going to do the same. What do I really want my students to remember? In other words, what do you want to move to the long-term memory store? That could be about the content. That could be about the experience, okay? What do you want them to remember? Number two is how can you chunk information so that their working memory is not overloaded? Go look at your modules. Go look at your presentations, the textbook that you've chosen for the course, or any other resources that you offer and answer that question. And the final question is, how can you tap into their prior knowledge so that a connection is easily made between the new information and what they already know or have experienced? Well, if you made it this far, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending this time with me. And I want to invite you to subscribe to this channel. And hit the notification bell so that when episode two is released, you will be one of the first ones to know. You can subscribe at bit.ly forward slash Kelly's channel. That's K-E-L-L-I-E-S channel. Until next time, I wish you well as you create dynamic learning communities online. Bye-bye.